Thank you, Asaf. And now, Robert Jackson from Columbia University. Okay, uh, thank you very much. I'm delighted um, uh, to be here. It's a real, it's a real privilege. Um, uh, thanks so much, Zohar, for, uh, for having me here today. Uh, I actually taught uh, corporate law uh, here at Ono last summer. In fact, I think some of my students are here. Uh, so you already know I don't know anything about corporate law. Uh, so I'm uh, not going to talk about that. Uh, instead, I'm going to focus on something that I do know a little bit about. And I'm going to explain why I think it's important uh, not only for U.S. markets, it's a paper focused on U.S. stock and corporate law markets, but also for um, emerging uh, markets, um, uh, increasingly growing markets like Israel's. Um, and the basic um, uh, idea here is uh, around the way that markets, uh, and stock markets in particular, incorporate new information about the company and its value into uh, the price of the company's stock. So. Um, uh, you might know this literature, but just to give you a little background, um, in general, we think that the value of a company's stock provides an important signal. It's a socially uh, relevant signal. It's a signal about what are valuable investment opportunities in our society and which ones deserve investment of capital. Stock prices have been said to serve this purpose for a long time. You see, the problem is that information, whether or not a company is a good one, a good set of investment opportunities, it's hard to figure out. Um, the kind of private information is costly to discover. Um, and in fact, we, uh, many have said, in fact, most famously, uh, Zohar Goshen, have said that the purpose of securities law, especially in the United States, is to help reveal this information. Yeah, and to help uh, inform traders trade on it. And in this way, through their important work, getting the stock price to reveal the value of the underlying opportunities, because this is an efficient way um, to allocate capital. Now, of course, there's another way you could, or in, uh, in addition to securities law, you could have information about the companies come out. You could let the insiders in the company trade on what they know. And in fact, in a series of articles and then a famous book in 1966, Henry Mann made this argument that perhaps that would be desirable. That's not the course we've taken in the United States. We instead outlaw trading on material non-public information. We don't outlaw insider trading. We outlaw trading on material non-public information, more on which in a bit. But in general, we've taken the view that we'll allow securities law to force the production of information in a way that encourages folks to make investments in learning about the firm and therefore make the firm's stock price more accurate. Now, in general, we have a rule in the United States. It's in what's called the 1934 Securities Exchange Act. Maybe you've heard of that before, right? Yeah, okay, good. So this law, well, you know, who knows? So uh, this law says that if something material happens to the company, if there's news about the firm, the firm has to disclose it on a form we call Form 8K. And it's got, and originally the 34 Act was interpreted to say the firm has five days to make this disclosure. Something happens on day zero, you have five days to tell the world about it. Now, um, uh, Form 8K includes all kinds of important information. In fact, the form is called disclosure of material information by its nature. Uh, the information is material or important in securities law speak. It includes information about material agreements the company has made, like merger agreements, for example, or what's happened to its managers, its directors, or its officers. Financial statements, earnings, all these things come out in Form 8K. Now, after the scandals around Enron and WorldCom in the, around the turn of, this, uh, turn of the, uh, the last century, uh, the Sar Sarbanes-Oxley Act said to Congress, hey, uh, said to the SEC, hey, you have to disclose this stuff. You have to force 8K disclosures on a rapid and current basis. And the SEC said, well, five business days is kind of a long time. Maybe we should propose a shorter period, like two days, which is what they did. And they were deluged by dozens of comments from corporate lawyers who said, well, this is very fast. You know, this is hard work for us, we're busy, we want to spend time with the children. So no, we should not do uh, two days. Instead, the SEC relented, as it usually does, and said, um, uh, we'll let you have four days to disclose this information to the world. Now, by the way, I say in my footnote here that in Israel, this is not the law. You have a different law. You have basically 24 hours to reveal this information, or else you'd get trouble, in trouble with Goshen and his friends. I'll say a little more about that later, but for now, just know that the law of the United States is you have four days to make this kind of disclosure. Now, as I say, in Sarbanes-Oxley, Congress said to the SEC, figure out exactly how long they should have on 8K, and they say four days on 8K, okay? But they didn't give the SEC this discretion with respect to another kind of disclosure. 
You see, in the US, you have to disclose when insiders are trading in the company stock. It's prohibited to do that on material non-public information, but even if you do it not on this information, if you make a trade, if you're the CEO, you have to tell the world on a different form. We call that form Form 4. And Congress in Sarbanes-Oxley said this form, no matter what, has to be filed in two days. Make sense? This form gives you all kinds of cool information. What's the name of the guy who's trading? What's the price at which he traded? How many shares, etc. So to summarize, companies in the US have four business days to tell the world about new information about them. And executives, insiders, have two days to tell the world about trading they're doing. And what I do in this paper is ask the question, basically for the first time, how do firms and executives respond to the fact that they have this time to do this, uh, uh, this trading? So let me give you an example. Here's a recent 8K just from last week. It's from this company, Kate Spade. I couldn't figure this out. Do, do, do you have this in Israel? No, no Kate Spade? No. Good for you. So yeah, so um, Kate Spade, I, I did some research. research. Kate Spade makes uh, fancy bags and shoes. You know, no? Yeah, I've learned from empirical uh, testing that when um, my girlfriend asks for stuff from here, I shouldn't ask questions, just buy the stuff. They, uh, they, they get a lot of my business, Kate Spade. And I want you to see Kate Spade. They filed this Form 8K just a few days ago, and they say, look, there are two different dates here to pay attention to. This is the date of the report, the date we filed the 8K. And then in parentheses, they have the date of the event that happened. You see, they know. They can wait a few days until after the event happens to tell the world about it. They know it because it's in the actual form. So in this case, for example, they um, disclose something that happened on May 19th, they filed on May 22nd. Yeah, so what I do is I pull from million, more than 4 million 8Ks, the information of the date on which the event occurred, and then the information on which it was disclosed. So I have two different dates in my data set. By the way, this particular 8K was a disclosure of material modifications uh, to rights of securities holders. It means they did something to the shareholders, basically made it harder to make bylaw amendments. Just out of curiosity, let me ask you, you have any intuition about this? Maybe I'll ask the Chief Justice. This date, the date that they did it, was what day of the week? And the day that they told the world was what day of the week? Any guesses? That's right. The day it happened was a Wednesday, and they, the day they told the world was a Friday. Why? Because the world's sleeping on Friday. And that's a better day to tell the world that you're screwing your shareholders. So um, uh, what the data allows me to do is identify the time when the event at issue happens, and then the date on which it's revealed. And I can see the way this uh, gap um, affects the way that people behave. So just to give you a, a concrete example about this, you can take a typical business day, like the, um, uh, the day on which a particular event happens, and you can see that the day that the event happens, I can take this out from the 8Ks, I use a computer program to do that, and then you've got four days, and you can choose when, that day, when the information will be made public. Make sense? Okay. And then the insider can also choose when to trade, but remember, they have a different rule. They have a firm rule that requires within two days, they have to tell the world what happened. Make sense? Okay, great. So the first thing you might want to be uh, interested, and I, um, I extracted all this information from about four and a half million 8Ks that have been filed over the last decade or so with the SEC. So uh, you might be interested to know, first of all, how do people behave when it comes to this um, filing? And here I'm just giving you a distribution. This is the number of days it takes most companies to disclose information on Form 8K with frequency on the y-axis. And you can see, and this doesn't surprise me, most companies disclose within a day or two. Um, I'll tell you why that doesn't surprise me in a moment, but you, the general distribution is such that in many cases, the, the information is disclosed not long after the event that occurs. There are, however, many cases where the company waits three or four or five days to the re reveal the information for the world. And you can imagine during that time, something important has happened, by definition, a material piece of information has emerged about the company. Insiders are likely to be aware of it. Time is passing and they don't reveal it until three or four days later. So the first question you might ask is, is it the case that insiders trade more often, that it's more likely that insiders will trade during this period, during this gap? You wanna guess? What do you think? Yes, of course they do. So in this regression, and I can go in some detail about this, uh, the way uh, that the tests work, 
But basically what we do is test the, po the probability that an insider will trade uh, in a situation where there is a gap, where there is a distance between the day they disclose, uh, the day of the event and the day they disclose, whether it's more likely the insider will trade. And one thing we have here is the benefit of a lot of data. So we get to run a fair number of tests that I haven't been able to run um, in previous work where I can fix the effects by firm, by date, even by individual. I can show that the very same individual is more likely to trade during one of the gaps than that same person uh, when they're not in the gap. And I show, I basically show that this uh, effect is very significant and very robust uh, over a number of specifications. So we show first that insider trading is a lot more likely during this gap. But you know, when I mentioned the two rules to you before, I noticed some of you were like a little interested in this. You said, well, the company has four days and the insider has two days. So you see, if the day the event happens, they trade, before the 8K necessarily will come, their own trading disclosure might come. You see, because they have a shorter period of time. They have only two days. So you might wonder, would an insider be more likely, instead of trading at day zero, the day the event happens, would they be more likely to shift their trading later in the period? Why? Because if they wait, their Form 4 won't come out until after the 8K. Yeah? And in so doing, they won't reveal, they won't signal to the market that there's material and underlying information. See, it's well known, actually, in the empirical literature that traders pay great attention to Form 4. They see the insiders trading, and they take signals about this, uh, of this about the firm's value. So what, the, um, uh, what, the, what, what we test is whether or not, given that um, uh, there's, an 8K on, there's an 8K that notes an event that happened on day zero, whether or not the um, insiders are more likely to shift some of their trading to later in the 8K window so that they'll disclose the file, the Form 4, after the 8K is filed. Make sense? So we run a test on that, just simply testing whether or not um, um, we see more trading disclosed in Form 4s filed after the 8K. And we find systematically that this is true when the lag that is the time between the event that's being reported and the 8K is actually filed, the longer that is, the more likely it is that an insider will have trading that is reported on a Form 4 after the 8K is filed. Make sense? It's a bit of a tricky specification. But one way to think about it is the following. You're an insider. You have information that's not yet been disclosed to the world. And you can do two things. One is you can trade right away. Yeah. If you trade right away, that might be the best way to make profit because, you know, markets are leaky by design. And so information is slowly being impounded into the stock price. You might want to move as quickly as you can. On the other hand, the law imposes a constraint. The law says if you trade today, even if the firm doesn't disclose till four days from now, you will have to disclose your trade in two days. See, this to me makes this finding all the more striking because what it suggests is that insiders are giving up some profit waiting when they know something material um, and shifting their trading until after so that they can report it after the 8K is filed. So um, uh, I'll show one more result uh, and then I want to just give some uh, of you about what this all might mean. So if I were you, I'd be thinking, look, Jackson, all the stuff you're talking about really doesn't depend only on 8Ks and Form 4s. You know, there's a real world out there. It's not all securities law, as much as Goshen would like it to be. You know, there's a real world happening, and in, from time to time, information will get out into the world completely apart from the 8K process. That is, the news will discover it and report it. And you might wonder whether or not this all changes depending on whether the news reveals it. You see, if the information comes out through the news, even if the company waits to file the 8K, the market price has impounded the information and the insider's trading opportunity will disappear, or to be more precise, her profits will decrease. Yeah, because the market will be aware of the information. So we got our hands on a data set from Dow Jones Newswire, which is one of the principal databases used by hedge funds and traders of this kind to pay attention to the news. And uh, we saw, we just evaluated whether or not when the information appears in the news, the insiders are less likely to trade during this gap. Yeah, so hold everything constant just like my last tests, but ask, we're during the gap, will the probability of the insider 
change if it's news, if the news reports the event? And the answer is yes. We show in a number of specifications, statistically significant, again, across individual fixed effects, we show that these insiders will trade less during the 8K gap when the news has revealed the information. This makes sense, their profit opportunity is less. By the way, it suggests part of what we see is that there's um, uh, a vibrant market in information. That is, the news is providing a valuable service for closing insider trading opportunities, or lessening them to be more precise, by revealing to the world that which the firm has not yet told the world. Make sense? This is a valuable kind of um, service for markets that the news is providing. So just to give a, a, a brief summary of what I think the implications of the, the paper are, um, and I'll just, uh, it's, a, it's at a very early stage, so I'm happy to take uh, comments from friends and colleagues. Wow, is this something I said? <laughs> the power, the college power. Wow. Mm -hmm. You guys can hear me, right? Yes, yes. yes. So three quick implications. The first is, I think it's, the paper suggests that to the extent that policymakers are concerned about fairness and disclosure and information being distributed to markets, this four-day time period gap should probably be considered. You know, what I'd like to just tell the SEC is that they should just adopt the law in Israel. But I'm not going to put it that way when I tell them because I want them to say some things. So the first thing is you should probably shorten this period if what we prioritize is speedier disclosure. By the way, you can query that, right? Whether it would be optimal to have speedier disclosure. Uh, but for now, to the extent that that's what the market, that that's what policymakers want, that's what they should do. If they care about equivalent disclosure and Reg FD and other things suggest that they do, they should shorten this period first. Second, the SEC has a number of rules that address insider trading around four 8Ks. For example, if the 8K has to do with a particular type of earnings announcement, they have the companies adopted what are known as blackout rules. Just a prohibition. The insiders cannot trade during this period, but it only applies to financial reports, which for that reason we took those out of our data set. You know, for me, it suggests that this, um, this rule might need to be brought because there's other kinds of material information that's not um, uh, that's not with earnings. And we give all kinds of examples that uh, that insiders appear to trade on. And then finally, I think one thing that's cool about this uh, project is we have a very rare setting where we have a situation where insiders have information and we later learn that they have the information exactly when they got it. Yeah. And this is a very rare type of setting. So things we can study include the kinds of profits they make or don't make when they trade on this information, and the kinds of trading they engage in, whether or not on average uh, they're, good, um, uh, they're good traders. I think further research should explore that. Please, professors always say that, so we have another paper. <laughs> 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 explore that. But that's a paper. Thanks so much for the chance.